I'm Frank Slifka. I'm Josh Sukowski. And I'm Crystal Teglin of The Almas, and you are listening to Music Existence. All right, welcome back to another instance of Music Existence, where because of music, we exist. We have with us three members of the band The Almas. We have Crystal Teaglin, Frank Slivka, and Josh Sikowski. And they are touring themselves into the ground. (laughs) This tour is just, it starts on the 21st and it just keeps on going. Plus you guys are touring the UK. This is the Lifeline Tour. You're promoting your Lifeline single. And there's still more dates to be announced. So how did that that motive, that ambition, like, all right, guys, we're going to do this. How did that start? Did you have experience from previous bands doing that? No. Uh, actually, I think the Almas is our three first time ever touring in a band. Mm-hmm. Uh, as like, like as a member of a band. As a member of a band. I've toured before, but. Uh, not as a band member and i think it all started because we got a random phone call saying hey are the almas available for such and such such and such a date to play in north carolina and we're like well you know we're from wisconsin right and they're like yeah well, we, you know we're happy to have you if you can make it possible it was two different shows in north carolina and frank's like well let's make it happen yeah we we never said no to a show <laughs> so we were like well i guess we gotta do it now <laughs> yeah, it was within our year of yes back in 2018 yeah. that we we took it on and it was only a week adventure that we did we played iowa um We played Tennessee and then we had like the two shows in Mm -hmm. North Carolina and that was it. It was just like a weekend. We were out for a week sleeping in our van and Mm -hmm. we were like, well, let's see if we can actually do this. And if we can, then let's start touring. So then come 2019, we booked ourselves for a month long tour. At the end of it, two months uh, we went out on tour for and we kind of just never stopped. We kept kind of just making them bigger and bigger as we go and touring more often and yeah, it was kind of like a exponential growth from then on. <laughs> mm-hmm. So besides the touring growth, um, how is that a testament to you guys as friends? Um, not only in your ability to endure each other, but accept each other and love each other just the same. I would definitely say being in a band kind of surpasses the whole friend term Mm -hmm. uh we're definitely family we butt heads we fight you know we're living in an e350 last year for 217 days like you know sometimes you want your space but at the same time when you know you see your bandmates going through something you know you help them out or it's it's definitely a family dynamic here We're, we're all pretty connected and we know how each other works and we know each other's likes and dislikes so uh it's it's Nowadays, it's pretty easy to navigate, at least for the three of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I I can definitely see that. Like, um, (laughs) Crystal, you in like one of your uh, um, press photos of of you in the band, you have like your arm around like one of the band members, and I think that's pretty cool. That that's a testament to your not only your partnership, your your familial energy is, mm-hmm. you know, a band, but just the overall being, that overall unification. I, I think Absolutely. that's really special what you guys have. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And so last year, you guys, like, did 120 shows. And for all that time being spent on the road, does it kind of feel like you're going about your usual business or is there still some things that you can derive from that experience that you still hold, you know, memorable to you beyond just performing on stage and being in a hotel room? Sure. Uh, you know, obviously you have the same day-to-day mundane things where you get up, we're going to take a shower, we're going to work out. 
but every day is a new experience out there. Even though you're going to an, maybe the same venue again, you know, you get to see old friends or mm -hmm. maybe since you've been in that town a couple of times, you're like, hey, let's go back to this, uh, our favorite place and maybe we'll discover a new place. You know, it's a it's a big world out there. So there's always something I, new, you know? Yeah, like as Frank said, as mundane as it can be, every day is still like a new adventure. Mm -hmm. I mean, like even if you're going back to a similar venue, you know, there could be new people there. They could yeah. have changed some things up. There could be new things going on with the street out front, you know? And uh, I think it's all about trying to make the most of your time when you're on the road yeah. to enjoy it. It's a, yeah, it, it's just an adventure, man. It's mm -hmm. like you're on va It's sort of like you're on vacation <laughs> for <laughs> that amount of time, you know? You have that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like it, it has that vacation feel, but you just have to do a job amongst your day yeah. you know you're like oh, i just got um, your, your vacation is dictated by your job yeah basically. yeah um yeah and as josh brought up um he mentioned going back a few times coincidentally and speaking of going back i wanted to take it to the be very beginning when you guys developed your musicianship when you were growing up where did that start and each of you can go when you want um, I think for me, when I first, you know, picked up an instrument, uh, that was, uh, I think I was at summer camp, I was 11 years old or something like that. And a friend of mine was in my cabin was playing guitar. And I thought it was cool. So a bunch of my other friends are playing too. So I wanted to learn. He taught me how to play smoke on the water on one string. And I annoyed everybody in my camp for like three weeks on playing that. <laughs> Um, but uh, going back and farther, my dad was a musician when he was my age and he played in bands and stuff back in the 60s and 70s. So um, he he also brought that in at a young age playing guitar for me. So yeah, for me, I only accidentally became a vocalist. And I say that because I was on a, a local TV show for our area where I would interview musicians from the area. Oh, uh, so I was on like that side. I was more like I did interviews and I did the production promotion side of stuff, but I was never like the one on stage uh, unless it was to introduce a band. Uh, then one day a friend of mine was like, hey, I'm going to come and pick you up. We're going to go hang out. It's like, that sounds like a fun time. Let's do it. And instead of hanging out, he took me to some random person's house dropped me off and said, this is tryouts for a vocalist position in a local band, have fun, and drove away. And so I only knew one song by heart, which was Blink-182's 1985. Oh. And oh. so I tried, well, Bowling bowling for Soup, Bowling for Soup, my bad. Oh, I misspoke. Uh, bowling for Soup, 1985. And so I, I sang that for the audition I didn't even know I was going to. And I ended up being in that band for six months. So I made it and that was my first time ever being a vocalist. But that was, oh, I think it was like 17, 18, 18. No, it was, yeah, it was, I was like 18 ish. Or 19, mm -hmm. one of the two. Somewhere if you in there. want to be really yeah. technical, you can check out the original 1985 by SR71. Yep. <laughs> That's yeah. going to even, it's even it, more team. But yeah, continue. It broke my heart when I found out that was a cover. I honestly, for the longest time, thought it was Bowling for Soup song. I was like, ah. <laughs> it was that rendition that I sang. But it was re it's really cool how you didn't really know that you'd be competent enough to be a vocalist, even though you have that one song, and lo and behold, this audition just set you on a path that you didn't expect, but it's like, holy shit, I'm actually doing this. I'm actually <laughs> yeah. of yeah, absolutely. a noise that isn't entirely like cringy and only gets pats on the back. Like I can actually affect people with my voice. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, um, for me, I started playing guitar when I was 13 years old. Uh, basically, I was listening to ACDC in my basement. I was downloading music, you know, on LimeWire. <laughs> uh, Same here, right? Uh, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, and all of a sudden I had played back in black and I just caught myself like rocking out in my basement. And I was like, man, I want to feel like that all the time. And I, I want to do that. I want to, I want to do that. I want to create that. So that's what started uh, really me and my guitar journey, uh, you know, and uh, at the time I had a crush on a girl in high school and she liked guys in bands. That's so always, it that's kinda, always it the number one facility. <laughs> yeah, that helps. It's always the yeah. Girl. So. That's what started me in guitar, and I'm 33, so I've been playing for 20 years now. So damn. Yeah, 33 too. Oh, Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> to the club guys. And you know, and um so Frank, you started this band back in 2016. I mean, that was like a very like I worry about those times because 2016 was like very heated politically and like I worry that like nostalgia is kind of like dying out when we consider like the heavy like political implications of the time unless you were like a really little kid but do you get nostalgic about those times as as far as forming the band? Oh uh, yes and no. <laughs> yeah yeah cuz it's such a mixed bag, right? Yeah, man, like, uh, I don't know. I never really let uh, politics or, or my views on it ever really affect my music or creation of things when I'm working. I, I try to keep everything very neutral um, because there needs to be a safe place for people, <laughs> you know, a, a place to get away. So, I yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm. I'm okay with moving on with the times or, or whatever yeah. and, you know, keep the past and learn from it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, yeah, there are, there are things I like from the past for sure. Yeah, but... I, I think I'm in the same boat, too. I, I, You know, looking back at some of my old bands, too, even before this band, you know, uh, how, how I, I guess you would say, unserious we were. I mean, we were serious enough, but we were just out there to have fun. And I, I kind of miss that in some aspects because, you know, at this point, it's it's like a job for us. But uh, I'm still having the most fun I've ever had playing in a band. So I, I look back on those times with fond memories, but at the same time, I'm still having a blast now. Yeah, it's just a more responsible kind of yeah, fun. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> I was drinking more and doing more crazy stuff back then, but uh, now it's just playing shows. and Yeah, the... Yeah. Fun. The, the fun is more meaningful yeah i suppose <laughs> speaking of having fun and having a blast um your early singles sin city talk about that one man that one we just wanted something that just grooved that just made people want to headbang and dance around Shake just, the booty you know, a little bit. just just have fun with it and that one we we still play on stage even to this day and it's just a really fun you know headbanger of a song that is one song that i don't have to worry about playing because it's so because <laughs> we've been playing it for so long i know how to play it with you my eyes closed. Autopilot yeah and just with it. I, it's a fun song to play too i'm really happy yeah to play that one. it was just we just wanted to write a banger man so yep. that's uh and give a little sex appeal you know in the early days is i uh, definitely wanted to have that <laughs> that bit in our song so you know, nowadays we need guys like you and like to you know get that energy back because we're like a really yeah. sterile nation now <laughs> yeah yeah you need you need a little fun a little we wanted life, to, we wanted to be raw and yeah, uh, yeah real and i love and i love that i love the production now who were you working with at that point Ooh, the older version of Sin City. So the demo version was done with Amiko Stanovich. 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 Yeah, he uh this guy, old friend. Old old friend of ours. He we recorded in his basement and uh uh he's just a really cool guy. It's where we did all our first recordings and stuff. Uh yeah, Miko, he's just a good guy. And he he's an old rock and roller too. Mm -hmm. So biker he, dude. Biker dude. So he got the vibes. And, yep. Yeah, he's a cool dude. He still comes out to our shows and stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. and then uh, we ended up re-recording the song um, so that it worked with the full album that we were putting out yeah. uh, called Truth Cells. Uh, yeah, we re-recorded in, 
in 2020 2020 is when we recorded it 21 2021 is when it yeah and and so that one uh was with cherry pit studios up in um was it menominee Menominee Falls. falls yeah with eric yep eric labrosse yep Mm mm-hmm and even then, you still have that raw kind of energy, and and I love that the songs like speak to a certain timelessness too. Like, you know, stuck in my head, I always got stuck in my head. <laughs> Seriously, and I love that it's not like overly pop, and it's not like. It's not to the point where in your, you know, rockness, you get lost on a lot of listeners. Like, I think it's really important to to have a good sound, but to make it so that it's not overtly squelchy and overtly polished. I mean, yeah. I just love that about you guys. And the the crazy thing is you have a catalog of singles that has mastered like the single craft, but without <laughs> compromising at any point. So it's really good. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. It means a lot. It's awesome. And um, so you mentioned working with uh, another guy before. Now, how has that sort of rotation of, you know, connections change as far as like getting your sound to a point where you could in essence reach a broader audience well that magic comes from mr kyle odell yeah (laughs) Yeah, we uh we worked with him out of nashville uh the first time that our ep that we been putting out singles for uh he was the guy who really helped us find our sound you know we we had went into that studio with five songs right and basic, he let us record one of them, <laughs> and then he, and he didn't really want to do the rest of them, and uh, so he wanted us to write like in his process, right? And we we didn't like where it was going, you know. We we went to Kyle because we wanted more a uh, more production. We wanted the wub wubs, and we wanted the whole the whole thing, you know, the, the whole stuff. modern thing. But we we didn't really like it because it wasn't us, you know, or so we thought. And uh, basically, we have a coming to Jesus moment. We go and eat, and we're like, man, we're not really happy with this, right? So we go back to Kyle, and I talk to Kyle. I'm like, hey, man, can I talk to you about this? And I, t- I, we talk, uh, I bring up our, our issues that we're having. And he goes, Frank, let me be honest with you. He's like, you know, your songs you brought are good, but he's like, I, I don't hear the almonds. He's like, I don't really hear it yet. He's like, if you're cool with it, we're going to spend these two weeks figuring out who the almonds are. And oh, he's like, are you cool with that? And I'm like, that, oh, yeah. So it was hands that off, is man. dedication, like, man. You don't find yeah. that nowadays because you see um, you bring a product to to a producer who's mixing your stuff and they get tired of that pissing match. They get tired of like, no, this has to sound this way and this. But he saw that you guys he knew and he trusted and he embraced your abilities and he knew what you guys normally brought to the table and that something was missing that is incredibly rare so you guys are really lucky no, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, know, even the song that Frank said that he he let us record one of the five songs <laughs> we brought in, that one even ended up getting completely changed. Yep. The only things we kept were the guitar solo and the vocals that we laid down. He Everything else. Solo. Yes, he, he, he literally did, he literally pressed delete and we watched it all just get deleted. Just yeah. all of it. Goodbye. And then he said, get me a monster. And <laughs> at one in the morning, we rewrote the song. It took like three hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's but, nothing for yeah. the archives. So like, no, no, no. And no, we pressed the delete yeah, button. It he, is like, gone. Delete. And that was actually one huge lesson that we learned from him as well is like, even though like we saw that and our brains were just like, oh, what did you do? Right. Yeah, exactly. we, we knew what there was. And so we were just like, oh, now it's missing. But he told us he was just like, 
don't hold on to things like that because the cool. audience, when they hear the song, they will never know what was there that was just deleted. He was like, they're only going to know what you're putting out. So don't hold on to things so much because even okay. if you miss something, the audience will never miss it. They never knew it was there. So let's make sure the song is the best that it can be instead of like, oh, well, I want this thing in the song yeah. or that thing right for the song, not for yourself. Yeah. So. You bring up a good point, Chris. So it's like, like whole albums potentially can be scrapped. Whole yeah. albums that you can spend like pretty much your life's work, your life's investment on. But it's good still to like keep to that point of having someone who who knows you and who still wants to learn about you and knows that you can do so much better, that you're capable of, you know, being like more than what you are presently. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Kyle's amazing when it comes to that. Uh, we owe a lot to him. We really do. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about um, your, you guys are proud advocates of mental health and wellness. And I always like, I love what you guys are doing. And you guys are straight to the point with your new single lifeline. And there's always been for a number of years, so many discourse, so much discourse rather, like we're talking about it, we're talking about mental illness, but at the same time, it's like people get the wrong idea and they try to accessorize with it. Mm. And they try to say, well, if you don't think this way, then I disagree with you. And then we can never be friends because of a single disagreement, but like instead of, or instead of like men and women working together it's men versus women it's like where did that like come about but you guys learn to transcend that so i guess it's kind of a repeat question but how do you manage that mental wellness through the dross of you know everyone else's kind of misguided kind of irrationality yeah um i think first and foremost is just knowing that yes there might be things that are going to bring us down uh you know mentally emotionally even physically uh drain us while we're out on the road but knowing that there's something greater that we're doing is bringing awareness and bringing a positive message to people, to a new audience at every city that we go to, every show we play, there's always going to be one person that might need to hear that message. And that kind of helps us keep going, or at least mm -hmm. I know for me is it's, it's the driving force to keep pushing and to know that, Hey, I might be going through something. Someone else might be going through something. And if I can share a positive message with them and help them in turn, that can help me as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the yeah, the thing is, too, like uh, what I said earlier in the interview, is about staying neutral in things. So it's just like everybody can find common ground. Even if we have disagreements, there's still a common ground we can all come together on. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, I like to walk that line. I want to be the bridge of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's easy to stay. For me, it's easy to stay focused because it's like I'm not going to pick a side. We're <laughs> You know, we're we're all gonna come together. <laughs> and then and gonna... Back in 2016, that's what it was all about. You pick a side, or you're like, yeah, no, no. Yeah, no. I've always I've always tried to walk the middle line with things, and uh, you know, with the band, we try to like we we stay the same way because our vision is, you know, we're all regardless of what your different views are, whatever you can, you're still gonna come to this rock show, and you're gonna listen to some good music, and that's the whole idea. So that keeps us grounded too, you know, keeps us from sort of fighting and bickering over things because we know that we, we're all neutral. We got to stay in the middle, man. Yep. So it, it keeps things peaceful and, you know, yeah. So you guys are uh, involved with uh, numerous veteran-centric 
uh, organizations, one in particular that came up in uh, your press piece is Rock to Stop 22. Um, tell me about your involvement with that. Well, we got asked to play that, that event back ooh, in 2018, 18, maybe. Yeah. And we've been uh, big advocates of helping that organization ever since, you know, and uh, it was back then uh, we never it never dawned on me that on average, 22 veterans a day commit suicide. It, it never crossed my mind. You know, we always hear about people dealing with struggle with suicide, this, that, but it never occurred to me that veterans struggle with in that, that many too. In that many. And uh it just hit me a certain way, you know. And uh yeah, yeah and so ever, ever since then we've just been always promoting that event, bringing awareness to our veterans. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because without them, we we can't tour this country freely and do what we want without them, regardless if you believe in the war that they're fighting, it doesn't matter. Um, you believe in the people. You believe in the people, you know, and the people who decided to serve their country. And so, yeah, ever since then, we've just been advocates of helping our veterans. Mm -hmm. so. And it ties hand in hand with the mental health yes. aspect of it, too. Mm -hmm. and that's really cool. And um, as far as your your further material, you have your single lifeline. Um, what other kind of uh, vignettes or branches of themes do you want to explore like on further material? Um, well, I, I know this EP that we just did had a lot of focus on mental health and it was kind of, uh, I don't want to say like a, a downer, but like, you know, it was very heavy in that aspect on the mental health side. And I think, you know, we kind of want to, in a way, continue the, st the story of it a but kind of make it the come up, you know, the the uh, resurgence of yourself, you know, and kind of um, do something, you know, like that. Yeah, you know, at the time we, we write, especially the last record, we wrote in the moment, you know, because we're forced to it. Uh, uh, a lot of us were going through a lot of mental struggles then, so hence why the album, uh, the EP came out the way it did. And like Josh said, I think all of us are in a much better place going into the studio come August. Mm -hmm. And I think so it's going to be a lot more positive vibes, you know, um, it's like it's the calm after the storm, you know, you know, after you, you're sort of sad and you get depressed and then all of a sudden you start feeling better. You're like, yeah, I can do anything now. Yeah, That's what we want to try to encapsulate in the next record is that feeling of like, I can do anything. Yeah, because that's I, honestly, I, there is a kind of a cycle in this band where like, you know, or in any band where, you know, things are going great, things are awesome. And then something happens where you just get, you know, dumped down the toilet. Yeah. You, know, you know, all your hopes and dreams get shattered. <laughs> yeah. uh, things like th things happen. And um, but I found that every time something like that has happened in this band, it just it, we've become exponentially better. Yep. And I'm excited to do that. Yeah, yeah. especially yeah. in the music. In the especially record. in the music. Yeah. So this one. This EP is called uh, Almost Two. So is uh, Truth Cells considered Almost One, or is the Almost One like the the forgotten record that will never see the light of day? Uh, it is a it deep is, cut, is, homie. Yeah. <laughs> it, it'll, it'll be on Lost Wave. <laughs> Remember the yeah, 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 yeah. It's on like some platform somewhere. You, you can you can find some songs on YouTube, I think. Oh wow! Yeah, you might be able to find it on YouTube, but yeah, it's Almost EP. It just, yes. it's just it's the almost EP. Yeah, that's on the dark web. Only. The, yeah, <laughs> that was lost gotta... wave community would be on this one. They yeah, recently, that was act, uh, that was the almost everybody original. knows they recently right. found everybody knows that that was like the, the, uh, yeah, yeah. the only knows that. and <laughs> the only remaining person from that era of the band is Frank. Yeah, that so, wasn't even Crystal. Yeah, it wasn't even that. my vocals on it or anything. So, and then after that, <laughs> our first full album uh, came out, I think, five months after I joined the band. We wrote, recorded, and released within like five or six months of me joining in uh, 2017, our Back to Bad album. And that one was very kind of like gritty and grungy kind of a vibe of that, where it's just like, well, let's go and put this one out. But that one's also lost to the online community. So that one's only a physical disc that we have like a short amount of copies left at our live shows. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And then, and then like 
I, this is kind of mythologized, but you might like no one does this anymore. But you might find an old, an old hard drive, like with with like an old mysterious hard drive that you have to like take the cobwebs off, and it's like digging for gold, yeah. or like a mysterious master reel, like. <laughs> covered in dust and cobweb yeah <laughs> yeah but it's it's so cool that you acknowledge your stuff from the past and that you're growing and you you continue to to keep at it and i like the themes that are expressed on your current material like it's why a song like cage and it's why a song like lifeline resonated because as you brought up you're going through your own struggles with um you know whether you have like something mental going on or something affecting you in a profound way you don't let that like interfere with your relationships or your friendships and that that takes a lot of courage that takes a lot of heart not everyone's strong enough to do that, to set aside whatever problems they'd be working with and say to whatever person who's trying to involve themselves, like, I still love you. I still care about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've all kind of over the years learned how to live with each other and, uh, you know, we know each other's likes and dislikes and, you know, how to help each other when we're in need mm -hmm. yeah and um like considering all of that and putting that all together um with the career that you've had thus far what have you learned about yourselves not only as musicians but as people the sky's the limit man yeah <laughs> we we have definitely grown up in this band i think and i know for me like being young and new in the music industry and everything else now you know just like i had to learn how to be our booking agent i had to learn how to navigate a lot of things that i never expected to have to learn and you know just when it comes to you know being in the band as a musician or just as a person growing and learning you know on as an individual it's there's a lot that I never really expected yeah I mean you know just recently we created our LLC and everything and uh, we're all business partners now um mm -hmm. yeah so I never thought that we I'd be doing business you yeah, know like I mean, legit business, business owner yeah <laughs> it's fairly divided between the two of you and it's not like oh I own the majority share of it yeah, yeah. Nothing like that. No, we all we wanted to make sure that the band and the brand of the band was taken care of and shared properly. And um, yeah, so I never considered things like that, especially like small business. So definitely growing up into that, it's been yeah. an experience. Yeah, <laughs> an experience. Put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome that you guys are not only expanding your sound, but you know growing as people in the same way and lastly is there anything you'd like to say to your fans well i think i can speak for all of us just thank you in to everybody that has listened supported come out to a show uh thank you so much for your support of the band because without anybody supporting the band there really is no point to keep going there is really no band to keep pushing so we do this for you mm -hmm. yeah we exist solely because of our fans and you're taking it worldwide you're you're doing a uk tour too and we are. imagine that too like you see bands that are have like a, a massive regional following where they're from but then like across the pond or elsewhere they're superstars <laughs> so right. who knows that might even happen to you guys i, I hope so man that'd be cool that would be really yep. cool <laughs>
But man, it's been amazing talking to you guys. Thank you so much for coming on. I love what you're doing. I love your sound. And you're always welcome back. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Thank man. you. We Yeah, would we love appreciate it. your time and having us and talking with us. This has been a really fun time. Yeah, thanks Yeah. for all the awesome questions, Yeah. man. They were good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Great interview questions, man. So good.